you have your Bibles this morning, be turning to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And last week we kind of had an introduction to the book of Romans, and this week we continue with that, uh, that introduction. And as I said a few weeks ago, the, the book of Romans isn't exactly an easy book to preach through. Paul's going to get into a lot of doctrine here. He's going to get into a lot of theology regarding the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But before he gets into that, uh, he wants to reveal his heart to these Roman people. He, he reveals his heart to the Roman people in these verses that we're studying this morning, verses 8 through uh, uh, 15. And in doing that, Paul, Paul gives us an example. He sets an example for us uh, and the marks, the characteristics, you might say, of a spiritual servant. Now, let me read it to you, verses 8 through 15. First, I thank God, my God, uh, through Jesus Christ for you all, uh, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my heart in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, uh, making request if by some means uh, uh, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see uh, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift uh, so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you uh, by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, uh, that I often planned to come to you, uh, but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Pray with me again just a moment. Lord, we're grateful for the reading of the word. Lord, we're grateful for this letter that you preserved uh, uh, through history, Lord, the inspired writings of Paul uh, to the church at Rome. And Lord, let us hear these words and understand. Lord, let us apply these words to our own life because just as Paul was called as a servant, we too are called to serve you as our Lord and King. So open our hearts and minds to the heart of a, of a true servant of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now, you know, I think there are times, times in our lives when all of us feel a little bit faith. A little bit faded. There are times when we're like uh, our church building here. We need a little freshening up. And many of our, our church members have been going through. We've been painting a sanctuary, painting in the hallway here. I'm grateful for Bob and Faye for painting the hallway next to us and uh, working the fellowship halls. We all need a little freshening up once in a while. And I think that's what Paul is doing for us this morning. He's kind of freshening us up. He's reminding us uh, some things that, that we already should know, but maybe we forgot. And he's speaking specifically here of spiritual service. I, I read these verses, and you might read them and think they're just kind of a random list of things that Paul is saying. But if you really read them in context with the, uh, the thought in your mind that the theme behind them is spiritual service, they run quite well together. I want us to remember as we move forward with our study of the book of Romans that this is a letter. It's a letter that Paul is writing to a group of people that he's never met before. Doesn't know them, he's never been to Rome. Uh, so this is a, 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 this first part is an introduction. Before Paul gets into all the doctrine, all the theology, all the deep teaching that he's gonna teach in the latter parts of this, this book, this letter, he wants these Roman people to know him a little bit. He wants them to know his heart. And in revealing his heart uh, to, uh, to the Romans, uh, we see here an example of what a, a true spiritual servant looks like. You might ask, why is this important to us? Why is this important to us? Why, why do we need this lesson in spiritual service? And the answer to that question is because we're all believers in Jesus Christ. We've all been called to that service. We've all been called to serve our Lord and our God in some capacity. Every one of us are fitted into the church. Scripture tells us for a reason. We all have a part to play. Every one of us has a service uh, to render. And Paul says in Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you, brethren, uh, by the mercies of God, uh, that you present your bodies 
a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. We all have a reasonable service uh, to commit uh, to for the Lord God. Uh, uh, Paul goes on in Romans 6.22 to say, but now having been uh, set free from sin, in other words, having been saved, uh, and not just saved from salvation, having become slaves of God, we're, we're called to be servants. We're called to be slaves of the God who saved us, the one that bought us out of our sin. We're called to be servants to our Lord. So this is important to us. This concept of spiritual service is important to us. It, it was important to Paul, and it's still important to us. The key phrase, I think, in the passage we're reading this morning is found in verse 9, where the word says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. Paul's, Paul's spiritual service was internal. He had an internal service. It wasn't necessarily an external service. Paul served from his heart. Uh, look, it's real easy for us real easy for us in our, our spiritual service and our service for others to let that service become kind of routine, to fall into a point where we uh, our service becomes kind of ritualistic. It's just something we do. It, it's real easy for our service to become something that's external. But Paul, in these writings, is teaching us our service has to be ex uh, internal. It has to be something that comes from inside of us. It's something that comes from the heart. So uh, this morning the question comes into my mind, what is it that separates, that separates those who serve from the heart to, from those who don't? What are the marks, what are the characteristics of one who is truly serving as a spiritual servant for our Lord? Now read this and the, the first thing that comes to my mind is that you have a thankful heart. A thankful heart in verse 8. And Paul says, for I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that uh, your faith is spoken of uh, throughout the whole world. Paul's heart was thankful. And what he was thankful for here were the faithful <coughs> Christians who were serving within the church in Rome. Uh, not only was he thankful for those who were there in Rome, in the Roman church, he was also thankful that their faithfulness had a reputation. That the reputation of the faith within their church was spreading, Paul says, all over the world. Wouldn't it be something? Wouldn't it be something if our church had a reputation for faithfulness that spread throughout this entire community? That would be something that Paul would say we should be thankful for. He was certainly thankful for it in Rome. Amen. Paul was always thankful. Always thankful for those who were in the churches where he had served. In, in Corinthians, he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you uh, by Jesus Christ. He was thankful for the faithful Corinthians. He was thankful for the church of Philippi. Uh, to the Philippians, he wrote in Philippians 1 verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And he was even grateful for individuals. Those who served, he, he was grateful for Philemon. And Philemon, uh, Philemon, whichever way you prefer to pronounce it, in chapter 1, verse 4, he wrote to that one man, I thank my God, and making mention of you always in my prayers. Uh, the Lord's servants, they're thankful servants, and mostly they're thankful for the other servants uh, of the churches that, that God has, has lifted up in a faithful manner. Amen. I, I, I witnessed some people. I witnessed some people over my life that have served the Lord that, uh, but they seem to do so with a, a, a grudgery. They seem to do so with bitterness in their heart. Uh, people that, that serve uh, that way, uh, they show me that they really don't have a servant's heart. They never find any joy. They never find any peace in the service that they're providing. Even though they're providing service for God, they're, they're not happy in that service. They're not, they're not joyful in it. We, we should be we should be thankful. We should be thankful simply because the Lord God has seen fit uh, to uh, give us the privilege of serving Him. Amen. Is that not something to be thankful for? Yes, sir. So the first mark of a, of a spiritual servant is to serve uh, with a thankful heart. Now, the, the second characteristic I believe that we see here in Paul is that a, a servant such as this also has a concerned heart. 
a concerned heart. On, on one hand, a spiritual servant is thankful. On the other hand, that spiritual servant is concerned. Paul says in, in verse 9, Without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. People who serve the Lord will pray for the people they are serving. Pray for the people that they are serving. Paul does just that. There, there are a lot of uh, uh, people in the world, there are a lot of uh, organizations in the world that do good deeds. Our service has to go beyond good deeds. I mean, even atheists do good deeds. People who don't believe in God at all, they do good deeds. Uh, there are organizations, uh, United Way, UNICEF, I can think of many who aren't necessarily Christian organizations who, who serve by doing good deeds. But what separates us from that is we have so much concern for the people that we're serving that we as Christians were willing to pray for those we serve. We have concern for them. And we need to understand what it is Paul's doing here. He's thankful for these, these Christians in Rome. He's thankful for those that are in that church. But he's also concerned over them. Remember, this is a new church. In Christian terms, this is a first generation, maybe now uh, some second generation Christians coming into the church for the first time. So this is a, a startup church, a new church, uh, and he's concerned for them. He's grateful that they're, they're in the church, grateful that they come to save in faith. But because their faith is so new, he has great concern for their faith. So he's praying for them. He's praying for them. You can almost hear Paul's prayer. He says, Lord, I, I'm thankful for these, uh, these Roman Christians. I have great concern for their faith. Uh, great concern for their faith because they're new in it. And, and I know they, they need some teaching down there. He says, but if it's your will, if it's your will, Lord, I'll go to them. I'll go to them and I'll, I'll help them with this. Now, how many of us pray like that? How many, now, how many times do we find ourselves praying for someone that we have a concern of? Lord, I'm concerned for so-and-so. I'm really concerned for their well-being. But don't send me, Lord. Send somebody else. I, I, can't, I can't deal with it, Lord. You need to send them. Paul didn't pray that way. He said, Lord, I, I'm thankful for them. I have concern for them. And if it be your will, send me because I want to help. Amen. Paul said, if it's your will, God, I'll go to Rome. And God eventually sent Paul to Rome, but Paul went there in a way he didn't really expect to go. Paul thought he would go of his own accord. Eventually, Paul would go there, but he would go in chains. He would go as a prisoner. Spiritual servants, they have a thankful heart. They have a concerned heart. And thirdly, they submit to the will of God. They submit to the will of God. Uh, all spiritual servants that submit to God's will. We don't, we don't operate outside of God's will. Our prayer should always be that, uh, that the will of God be done. We don't want to ever operate outside of His will because if we're operating outside of His will, uh, then we're not going to succeed. Amen. There's no way you can succeed operating outside the will of God. Right. Now, another mark of a Christian servant is, is love. Paul says in verse 11, for I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. Uh, Paul, uh, if, if there's one thing, if there's one thing that, that drives us, one thing that drives us to serve other people, uh, that one thing has to be love. We truly love those folks. Paul, uh, we see that in Paul's life. Paul loved this church at Rome, even though he had never been there, even though he didn't know uh, those people. He, and he tells the Romans here in this letter, he says, I have a great desire. I have a longing in my heart to come to you and serve you and bring you some kind of a spiritual gift. And he's doing that for their benefit. There was never anything, uh, any, any motivation in Paul's work that was selfish. Paul's work was always for the benefit of others. Uh, Paul, uh, in this letter, he'll tell us eventually that he has it in his mind. Of course, he won't ever get there, but it, it wasn't in the will of God. But he wanted to go to Spain. He wanted to go to Spain, and he thought he was going to pass through Rome on his way to Spain. But he didn't go to Rome with any idea in his mind. His desire wasn't driven by some, uh, uh, some means of increasing his resume, so to speak, as many pastors do. They, they go from one church to the next, in each case, moving up the ladder as they increase their resume. That wasn't Paul's desire. Paul... Paul didn't go to Rome as some missionaries do. They go on missionary trips these days. Uh, he didn't want to go to Rome to see the sights. 
I've known some people that went on a mission trip that didn't have much to say about the mission they went on, but they told me a lot about the beach they laid out on. You know, and I'm not knocking missionaries. Some people do great missionary work, but some people go for the wrong reason. They think it's a vacation. Paul didn't want to go to Rome so he could visit all the, uh, the, the massive Roman architecture and all that stuff and see the sights. Paul didn't want to go to Rome so he could rub elbows with the, uh, the Roman uh, higher-ups, the people in political power. He didn't want to do that. That wasn't his point. He didn't want to go to Rome because he thought maybe the Roman church would pay him a little better than that uh, church he left back there in Corinth or Ephesus or Philippi. Paul wasn't ever motivated by selfish reasons to do what he did. Paul was motivated by love. He was motivated by love for these people in Rome. That's the way it should always be. I, as pastor, should never serve you for money. I should never serve you with any motivation other than for the fact that I love you. Amen. And I do. Uh, you, the same works for you. If you're going to be in ministry, if you're going to be in ministry of any kind, whatever ministry it is that you've been called to, whatever, uh, uh, whatever work it is that God's called you to do, your motivation for that work should be to love the people you are serving. True love. True love says, I'm going to do what's best for you, regardless of how that affects me. That's, that's Paul's attitude here. And that Paul, uh, that attitude, that attitude led Paul uh, to, be a, uh, to be a very fruitful pastor. Concerning love, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, writing to the Corinthians, he said in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 15, I, I will gladly, uh, I will very gladly spend and be spent uh, for your souls. Uh, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. Paul told the Corinthians, he says, I love you so much, I'm willing to, to pour out everything I am for you. Everything that I am, everything I have, everything I've got, I'm willing to pour that out for you. Even if you don't love me back, I'm willing to do that. Amen. That's the heart of a servant. That's the heart of a servant. It's that heart that says, I'm going to do whatever, I, whatever it is that uh, is best for you, even if what doing best for you brings me pain. That's what I'm going to do. Again, there are a lot of people who serve without love. They serve without love. The same people I talked about earlier, those same people that are, uh, that are angry all the time, those same people that cause divisions, that cause problems, uh, they're the backbiters, the gossips that Paul speaks of in other places. They, they never experience any real joy from the service that they've done because there's no love behind their service. Our service has to be motivated uh, by love. We as spiritual servants, we never serve out of pride. Instead, we serve with humility. Humility, Paul, and that's another mark, another mark of our spiritual servants uh, is humility. Paul says in verse 12, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. That's a, that's a really humble thing for Paul to say. Think about it. Paul's, Paul's an apostle. He's been sent by Jesus Christ. He carries the revelation of the Word of God in his words. Yet, he doesn't take any pride in that. He doesn't take any pride in his position as an apostle. Paul never did. He's telling these Romans, I want us to share in this ministry because it's a mutual thing. We share a mutual faith together. Paul realized there are other people other than him who have spiritual gifts. Other people other than him who have uh, a gift that God has given to them so that they can be uh, useful within the church. And he says, I want us to encourage each other. I want us to love each other. I want us to do this ministry together. There's unity in this. Amen. A spiritual servant has a high level of commitment and a low level of pride. Uh, Paul's, uh, Paul's saying... Uh, I, 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 want to, I want to come to Rome and I want to teach you. But when I get there, I also want you to teach me because you, I have a lot that I can learn from you. And I think every pastor is in that position. If I come here with an attitude that I'm the only teacher in this building and that I can't learn anything from you, then I've got it backwards. I, well, I've already learned a lot. I can tell you from you folks in the three years that I've been here. You've taught me a lot. And I hope you've learned something from me. And I think that's the way it should work. Now, when you have that kind of an attitude, the next mark that will follow that is fruitfulness. Uh, a spiritual servant reaps fruit. The women's class, I think, in Sunday school, you've been talking some in there about the law of the harvest. The more you sow, the more you reap. And I think we as spiritual uh, servants, we, we should set a goal to be reaping fruit. Paul says in verse 13, Now I do not want you to be unaware 
brethren, uh, that I often have planned to come to you, but I was hindered uh, until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. That, that should be the goal of our spiritual service, is to reap fruit. To reap fruit. Whatever service you're in, whatever ministry you are called to, your ultimate goal should be to reap fruit. As spiritual servants, we can never be satisfied with just meeting people's physical needs. Just meeting their physical needs. We have to meet their spiritual needs as well. It can never be my goal as pastor, as preacher, to stand up here and just tell you a good story every Sunday so that you feel good about yourself. That should never be my goal. My goal should be to reap fruit. It can't be the goal of the Sunday school teacher to just get through the lesson they planned for that day. It can't be the goal of a, of a food ministry to just make sure that hungry people are fed. It can't be the goal of the music ministry to just make sure we put on a good show. It has to be the goal of all of our work to reap spiritual fruit. And now that brings us to the question, what, what is fruit? What's Paul talking about here when he talks about fruit? Well, scripturally speaking, there are three kinds of fruit. Paul mentions in Galatians 5, verse 22, the, the fruits of the Spirit. He, he speaks there, uh, he says, but the fruits of the Spirit is love, uh, uh, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Those are, uh, we might consider those attitude fruits. Attitude fruits as we do our, our spiritual service for other people as we act out our, our service for others, one of the fruits that we should be trying to gain is an attitude change. Those people that we're serving, as we're continually serving them, we should see changes in their attitude. We should see an increase among those people we're serving, a, uh, an increase of things like love and joy and peace and patience and, and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All of those things should be things we are reaping. But also understand that, that action is another type of fruit. Not just attitude, but the action that follows the attitude. Paul writes in Romans 6, verse 21, What fruit did you have then, in the past, in things in which you are now ashamed? Well, those simple things that you did before you came to Christ, what did you gain from that? What fruit did that bring to you? And he says, really nothing. He says, for the end of those things is death. But now, now that you're saved, having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit in holiness. And holiness. And, and the end of that is everlasting life. Spiritual fruit is seen in holy living. So as we as we perform our, our spiritual service for others, what we should see in those others that we're serving is an increase in their righteous living, an increase in their degree of holiness. That's one of the types of fruit that we want to reap as we serve. But also understand there's a third kind of fruit. And I'll call that additional fruit, added fruit. Paul says in verse 13, that I might have uh, some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. That's our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal. That's our ultimate gathering of fruit. That's our ultimate reaping, the harvest as the women are studying. We, we should be in this. So the souls are, are saved. So that we, we're, we're in this, our, our fruit, fruit that we're truly after is converts, people who are saved by, by their faith in Jesus Christ. Our, our service should result in people who are coming to saving faith in God, coming to saving faith in Jesus, and also being added to his, his body, added to his church. As servants, we are to serve the one true king. And our goal in service is to reap fruit, to reap fruit of, of attitude changes, to reap fruit of, uh, of life changes, and also to reap additional fruit by, by adding to the kingdom of God, by, by making sure souls are saved and people are being added to the church. So when Paul, when Paul, when Paul finally went to Rome, when he went there as a prisoner in chains, uh, despite the fact that he went there in chains and was in prison, the amount of fruit that he reaped while he was there was massive. Souls were saved. 
Even though Paul was there in chains, souls were saved, people were being added to the church. He wrote from his prison cell in Rome to the church at Philippi. He wrote to the Philippians there in Philippians 4 verse 22. All the saints greet you. All of these saints, all of these people that have come to saving faith here in Rome, they all greet you. And especially those who are of Caesar's household. Can you imagine that? Paul was even reaping fruit from those who were closest to Caesar, the emperor, that were coming out of, the, out of that household and being saved. Great fruit was being reaped by this man, Paul. That's the joy of our service. That's truly the joy of our service, to see souls saved, to see people who are coming to saving faith in Jesus Christ, to see people coming into the church. That's where the joy of our service is found. Your service. But understand this, Paul says that his service is also marred by an obedient spirit. He says in verse 14, I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise. Paul says he has an obligation to fulfill. He has a debt to pay. He told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16, he says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. It, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul, Paul says, don't pat me on the back. Don't pat me on the back for what I'm doing. Don't, don't give me some kind of an award. Don't go down to the trophy uh, house and buy me a plaque to hang on the wall. Don't name your church after me because this service that I'm doing has been laid upon me. It's something that God has given me to do, something that I have to do. He says, if I don't do what God has commanded me to do, then woe is me. There'll be a, a curse on me if I don't do what God has commanded. I have to be obedient. Paul, Paul didn't... Paul didn't seek the ministry himself. He didn't, he didn't seek by his own will to become a preacher of the gospel. That was demanded of him by God himself. He had to preach the gospel. He was obligated to the Lord to fulfill that for, for the Lord's sake. Now, how did, how did Paul do that? He does it the same way we do it. We, too, have an obligation as, as God has saved us. As we are saved by our faith in Jesus Christ and we're called into service, we have an obligation to fulfill, to be uh, obedient to our call to serve. How do we do that? The same way Paul did, he obediently served both Greeks and barbarians. That's a strange language in our, in our word, uh, you know, in the English language, to think about Greeks and barbarians. What, what is it that Paul meant when he said, I, I'm indebted to both Greeks and barbarians? Well, in that Roman culture in that day and time, uh, those people who were able to speak the Greek language, the ones who were called Greeks, they were considered to be wise people. They were considered to be educated people. On the other hand, you had people who, uh, who couldn't speak Greek and they were called barbarians. And the word barbarian comes from the fact that the Greek-speaking people, when they heard those other people speaking in their language, it, it only sounded to them like they were saying bar. Bar, 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 bar. That's all they heard. Whenever they heard those other speak, people speak, so they called them barbarians. That's where the word comes from. In that culture, the Greeks were considered wise people. The, uh, the barbarians were considered unwise people. And what Paul is saying here is, I've been called to serve everybody. Everybody. doesn't matter who they are. Doesn't matter where they came from. Doesn't matter what their background is. Doesn't matter how much money they have, how much education they have. He said, I'm not just called to be around people that are like me. I'm called to be around people of all types. No matter where they are on the social ladder or the financial ladder or the educational ladder, I'm called to serve Greeks and barbarians. We're called to the same. We're called to be obedient. We're called to do what God has called us to do regardless of who the Lord sends to us to serve. I'm going to close with one more mark. One more mark of a, of a spiritual servant. A spiritual servants are marked by a heart of eagerness. Eagerness, an eager, an eager heart. In verse 15, Paul says, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. Paul had a desire to be obedient to, to the obligation, so to speak, that God had laid upon him. But understand, Paul... I never did that reluctantly. Paul had a great desire, a great desire to do what he was doing. He was an e had an eager heart. Uh, he was eager to go about the work of God. He says, I'm going to serve God with everything that's in me. I'm going to serve with everything that I have, everything that God has given me. I'm turning it all back to Him. I'm serving Him with everything. 
He wrote to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9. He said, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. Paul's ultimate goal was to be pleasing to God. Uh, so he was eager. He was eager. Eager and willing to be about the business of God. He was eager to go out. I think of Paul as being like some kind of a raging bull when it comes to his service. He was like, a, I used to have a dog named Lucky. And, and Lucky uh, lived with Beverly and I. He was our first child and our only child, really, uh, for 17 years. I took that dog on a walk, and every time I'd tie him to the leash, he would nearly snatch my shoulder out of the socket. And that was Paul. He was anxious. He was willing. He was ready. When it came time to get out the door, he wanted to go. He didn't want anything holding him back. So Paul was anxious to get to Rome. He was anxious to get started. There are too many times, I think, in our lives where we need, uh, where, where we feel like we need somebody kicking us in the seat of the past in order to get us out to, to serve. Uh, I don't think it should be that way. We should be eager to serve. Like Paul, we should be anxious to serve. We should be ready to serve. We shouldn't have to have someone pleading with us to come to church. We shouldn't have to have someone pleading with us to go out and do the work of the Lord. We should be eager to do that, ready to do that, ready to serve our Lord. So what are the marks of a spiritual servant? It begins with a thankful, concerned heart that seeks the will of God. Spiritual servants, they're marked by their love. They're marked by their humility. They have a great desire to go out and, and, and do the work of the Lord. They, they, they want to reap fruit. They want to reap fruit of attitude changes. They want to reap the fruit of life changes. They want to reap the fruit of addition. Lastly, they're marked by their obedience and, and an eager heart. An eager heart. Those are marks of the servant as I read them here in this scripture. Friends, what we need to understand is we're all called to that kind of service. Every one of us in the church are called to that kind of service, that level of service. I pray that as a church, uh, we, we serve. And we serve eagerly, we serve thankfully, we serve obediently. All of these marks should be found in every one of us, regardless of whatever service it is you're called to. Now, not all of us are called to be evangelists. Not all of us are called to, uh, somebody may be called to, to serve food or, or, or clean a bathroom. Whatever your service is within the church, do it with these things in your heart. Mostly as I read these, and, and Jesus has already taught us, the big thing here is love. Do whatever you do out of love for other people. That's the true mark of a servant. The law of love applies to the law of the harvest. So we're, we're certainly to do these things with love. I hope with these uh, things in your mind that you'll be eager to serve in the coming weeks. And with that said, we're going to uh, end there. I'll ask Miss Faye if she'll come up. Next week, God willing, Paul is going to start talking about the gospel. And I think we'll enjoy that greatly. Uh, I think you'll hear it uh, from Paul's uh, point of view a, a little differently, maybe than... Uh, uh, then you've heard it from other scriptures, but the, what Paul teaches is begins to teach next week in verse 16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And uh, we'll go from there. Uh, let's see. That's a good one. Let's sing number 386. Let's stand and sing number 386 together.
I went by and I talked to Russell uh, this past week, and Russell's expressed an interest that he wants to join our church and become a part of our family. Amen. And uh, Russell, uh, Russell wants to be baptized. Uh, so he wanted to come for you this morning and, and express that for you now. Uh, we, we, those of you that have talked, we know Russell has some trouble speaking because he's had a stroke in the past. And uh, I, I don't know, Russell, you, you, you do want to join. Right? Yeah. You want to join and, and you want to receive baptism. Yeah. Uh, Russell and I have talked and uh, his faith is genuine. He believes in Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm convinced that he will be a, a good member for our church that he's presenting himself for membership this morning. I'll offer a motion to accept as a candidate for baptism and after baptism in the full church fellowship. Do you have a second? Second. All those who are church members who are in favor of receiving a, uh, Russell as a, a member of our church uh, uh, based on his baptism, which will be upcoming in, in a few weeks, uh, uh, all those signify by saying aye. 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 Amen. Russell, you are a member of our church upon your baptism, which we will, we'll talk about here in a little bit, all right? Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. We're grateful for Russell. Amen. I'm sorry? After church, we need to do a hand of fellowship. Absolutely. After church, we're going to offer Russell the hand of fellowship and walk him into our body. Um, I hope I won't offend Russell, but uh, Russell, Russell needs friends. Russell needs a lot of loving on you know, he's been through a lot with his stroke and the things have gone on in his life these past uh, years or so. And so, uh, y'all, you know, like be the loving people that I know you are and, and really uh, reach out to Russell. He needs you. But, you know, we need him too. Right? Yeah. Russell's going to bring some things to the, place, to the table for us. Uh, I'm, I'm glad he's with us. Let's sing this verse, uh, this song, if, if we have it one more time. But just uh, that we'll close with one verse and then we'll close with a prayer. The family of God. I'm so glad I am a part of the family of God. I've been watched in the mountain, lived by his light. Russell's going to stand with me back here.